thank you everybody for joining us tonight, particularly with the convention going on. I'm sure other of you uh, may want to watch that as well. So uh, I know the name of the title was on uh, general knee pain. Uh, I am going to focus mainly on knee osteoarthritis since that's the most common injury we see. But a lot of what I'm going to talk about does apply to a range of other knee injuries. Yeah, so uh, what I'd like to cover tonight, first just a, a real brief overview of osteoarthritis. Uh, we won't go into too much depth. Uh, and then I wanna really focus on a lifestyle medicine approach to treatment, which might be new for some of you. And then the role of supplements that you can use, particularly natural supplements, and then some of the newer uh, biologic injections that are being offered in our clinic and, and really around the country. Uh, knee osteoarthritis um, is really incredibly common. It affects uh, more than uh, 30 million Americans. And because of that, a lot of these patients go on to have knee replacements. Um, and the volume of this is expected to increase uh, substantially. By 2050, the volume of knee replacements will increase by 147%. Now, unfortunately, uh, while that is a really good procedure for patients who need it, it doesn't always work out perfectly. And that's why you do want to try other options before you uh, resort to that treatment. There are a number of risk factors for knee osteoarthritis, and I won't go into all the details here, but uh, understand that you've got systemic factors. You're, there's even a genetic predisposition for this, certain genes that are going to predispose you, your age, your gender, your diet, bone density, uh, whether you've had a previous knee injury, um, and the type of activity you do. Um, so all these things factor in to whether you're going to develop knee osteoarthritis and then how it's really going to manifest. Half of the world's population over age 65 suffers from some form of osteoarthritis. But the predominant uh, place uh, that we see this is really in the knee and probably second in the hip. And we're seeing more and more of this now just because the population is getting older. And also because unfortunately, particularly in the United States, we still have many people who are dealing with obesity. I want to go over a uh, real brief again, but this is a standard classification system that we use. It's called the Kellergren Lawrence uh, classification for osteoarthritis. And grade one is just where we start to see some little bony spurs or what we call osteophytes. Grade two, you're going to start to see a little bit of narrowing of the joint where the cartilage is. And that starts to regress. And then eventually you have complete loss of the joint. So ideally, we really want to catch things earlier. By the time you get to grade four, that's when you really need a knee replacement. What's interesting to me, and I'm going to go into this later, is that a lot of times patients come into clinic and they've got what seems like pretty bad arthritis on their x-ray but they don't really have much in the way of symptoms and they're still functioning at a really high level. And as we go on, I'll explain my theory on this. My overall approach is really first to control people's pain and then to improve their quality of life and then to improve their ability to move in a way that's functional, that helps them in their daily life. Uh, I want to limit the use of pharmacologic medications and the side effects that come with those, and ideally to impact the progression of the disease. So this brings me to lifestyle medicine, um, which is really one of my passions. And we're actually developing a new lifestyle medicine center here at Stanford. But lifestyle medicine is really dealing with things that are common to all of us. So proper sleep, nutrition, exercise, um, stress management, and how these things impact our health. And in fact, these also affect knee arthritis and how it manifests. These are some of the things I'm going to cover today, um, but it's just a sampling of what really what falls under uh, lifestyle medicine. 
the first thing is really the importance of exercise. And, and you know, if this was a drug, people wouldn't believe how good this is. Um, and, and this is more profound than anything else we can offer patients. Uh, there have been a number of studies looking at exercise in the osteoarthritis. And there was a review in 2015 of 54 studies and found that moderate to high evidence that low to moderate impact exercise improved pain, physical function, and quality of life. And they looked at different types of exercise and resistance training uh, really stood out as the most effective regimen for offering pain relief, particularly in the older population. Now people say, well, gosh, I may not have time to exercise. I don't know how to exercise. But the new guidelines on exercise suggest that, you know, you can break this up into small, shorter bouts during the day and still have the same benefits as a longer exercise session. And some of this can be things that you do just as part of your daily life, like mowing the lawn, or I know I've been doing a lot around the house lately, like washing windows and things. And that's part of my exercise right now. Um, so just take breaks when you can. If you can't devote yourself to a full exercise session, it's still going to add up. I want to highlight this study because uh, it recently came out in a very respected journal, Osteoarthritis and Cartilage. And it really highlights the role of exercise for the treatment of osteoarthritis. Uh, so what they did is first... Uh, they took the people who were participating and did some biomechanical testing. And each person had an individual assessment. And then there were two small group education sessions with a the physical therapist. The first one gave them information on the pathology of osteoarthritis, the risk factors, symptoms, available treatments. The second session focused on coping skills, self-management strategies, and an actual motivational message, <clears throat> excuse me, on the role of exercise as the core treatment, and then ways to incorporate that into their daily lives. They were then given three choices. You could decline this and not participate, do no exercise. You could participate in a supervised exercise class or have a home uh, program adapted for you. But the goal was to get patients up to 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. And what they found was very dramatic. So, they looked at patients at three as well as at 12 months. And there was a significant reduction in their pain. They needed less medications. Uh, they had less avoidance behavior uh, with movement. They were less willing to undergo joint surgery. They scored much higher on quality of life measure, the EQ5D. And they lost fewer days uh, to sick leave. Now, when they looked at the individual program for us the group exercise, they found that the individual program was slightly better. But I think this is really individual. Some people like the group exercise. They find that very motivating. Some people prefer individual. Um, so I, I don't make too much of that. The most important thing is to do the exercise. They also found that Tai Chi was very effective. And I'm a real big proponent of Tai Chi because it's a non-impact exercise. It's a great way to work your balance, your leg strength, and your joint mobility. And studies have clearly shown uh, that patients who do this um, have improved physical function with uh, their knee away. Any water-based therapy can also be very helpful, um, whether it's doing some deep water running, deep water exercise class, or even just walking in the pool or doing some type of exercise. I know in our town, Palo Alto, the YMCA has some phenomenal classes for this. Uh, what's nice about the water is that you're in an anti-gravity environment, so you can really work the range of motion, you can work the strength, uh, but the joints aren't under the same kind of uh, force. And uh, patients come out and they feel wonderful. Uh, really a lot of their aches and pains go away. So it's really a great way to keep going. You're going to, I'm sure you've heard about other ways to relieve pain. Um, and these are just really for temporary pain relief. Um, but there is some moderate evidence for acupuncture for something called TENS or for laser. But again, this is just for pain relief. 
and it's only temporary. Things like therapeutic ultrasound or neuromuscular electrical stimulation, there really isn't any good evidence that these do help with pain. Another treatment that I want to go over uh, is gait retraining. And some of you may not have heard about this. And this is a study that was done by one of our Stanford graduate students a couple years back. And what he tried to identify was what's called the knee adduction moment. Uh, essentially what happens, and I hope this isn't too confusing for people, but most arthritis we'll see in the knee uh, generally starts in the medial or the inner knee compartment. And this puts what's called a varus thrust on the knee. And that creates this increased knee adduction moment. And we know that a higher peak of this knee adduction moment is associated with increased severity of knee osteoarthritis. So uh, Dr. Scholl put patients through a six-week gait retraining program focusing on decreasing this first peak of that knee adduction moment and found significantly increased function in these patients. And they also found that this uh, held uh, not only at one month, but six months and even a year down the road. Other ways to create sort of a similar benefit to the gait retraining don't work quite as well, but other things that you can do, uh, one is called a valgus unloader knee brace. And the idea is to unload that medial compartment and put more stress on the lateral compartment uh, where the knee is more healthy. But they also have these to do, work the reverse. For those patients who have worse arthritis in the lateral compartment, and less in the medial, there's uh, what's called a varus unloader brace. And there have been some studies on this, uh, plus minus in terms of clinical benefit, but it is worth trying um, for those patients who are looking for something with their activity. Another way to approach this is to actually put a lateral heel wedge in your shoe. And if you look at these photos, this is before and then this is after the heel wedge. Um, and there are some uh, studies that have looked at this, uh, but with mixed results. So it is an alternative to the valgus bracing um, and something you can consider. Another way, and something that I really do like, uh, is this special shoe. And this was developed at the Stanford Biomotion Lab by Dr. Tom Andriaki. And he essentially built in uh, a stiffness in the lateral part of the shoe that mimics that lateral wedge. And this could be a, a nice way that you can just have that built into your shoe. You don't have to put anything special. You don't have to put on a brace. And it's a nice way to also address that increased knee adduction moment. So this study uh, to me is fascinating. Um, again, comes from osteoarthritis and cartilage, a uh, very well-respected journal. And what they found is that uh, patients who had knee osteoarthritis had increased inflammation, not just in the knee joint, but throughout their body. And they measured this with what's called a high sensitivity, sensitivity uh, CRP, and they also looked at interleukin-17. Now, we know that systemic inflammation contributes to a lot of different uh, problems in the body from atherosclerosis, uh, um, all different types of arthritis, um, even dementia. So by decreasing this, it can help your overall health, but it can also help your knee osteoarthritis. So how do we do this? Well, one of the most important ways you can address this is with your diet. Um, there are many diets that can do the same thing. Um, a plant-based diet is the one that's uh, promoted by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, but that's not necessarily practical for everybody. Uh, what I propose for a lot of my patients is the Mediterranean diet because that, that seems to be a, a little bit more um, tolerable for all their uh, food likes and dislikes. But it still emphasizes fresh fruits, vegetables, nuts, beans, whole grain foods. 
uh, but it does allow moderate amounts of dairy, poultry, eggs, and seafood, and even a little bit of red, lean red meat occasionally. And the idea is by decreasing the systemic inflammation, we're reducing these inflammatory cytokines or these inflammatory proteins that are implicated in the osteoarthritis. The other benefit is that it can assist with weight loss. This is a nice study from the UK that put patients into a 16 week intervention, uh, a control group versus those with the Mediterranean diet. And those in the diet group had a reduction in their body mass, a reduction in these inflammatory cytokines, and also a reduction in serum cartilage oligomeric matrix protein, which is a marker of progressive NEOA. So when this goes down, it's telling you that the cartilage, um, or when it goes up, the cartilage is breaking down. So we definitely want to decrease that. The other thing to think about is weight loss, um, particularly uh, if you are obese. And I know what patients always say to me, doc, look, I want to lose weight, but I can't do it until I can exercise, until my knee feels better. Um, but just keep in mind that just a 10% weight reduction can improve knee function by 28%. And just one pound of weight loss will unload four pounds of joint stress on the knee in people with knee osteoarthritis, which is equivalent to 4,800 pounds for just one mile walked. So definitely something that is worthwhile if, you know, once you can start to get moving again and with the right kind of diet. In terms of supplements, uh, the one you've probably heard the most about is glucosamine and chondroitin. It's the best-selling best dietary supplement in the U.S. Uh, there's two components. The glucosamine is a water-soluble amino monosaccharide, but this is naturally present in very high quantities in your joint food and the synovial food and in your cartilage uh, that lines the joint. And this helps, helps regulate the anabolic processes of the cartilage and the synthesis of synovial fluid. You then have chondroitin, which is the sulfated glycoaminoglyceride. It's also present in articular cartilage and it helps provide some resistance and elasticity to the cartilage. You can think of the cartilage as kind of like a big, thick piece of sponge that gives you the shock absorption ability uh, within the knee. The recommended dosing uh, is about 1,500 milligrams of glucosamine, 20, uh, 1,200 milligrams of chondroitin per day. The side effects are typically quite minor. Uh, it's been reported that you could have GI discomfort or a headache, but quite honestly, I've never had a patient complain of that. This is the best study that was been uh, done looking at this. This was uh, done uh, through the National Institute of Health. And they examined the impact of six months of supplementation with glucosamine and chondroitin on knee osteoarthritis. And they found that patients had moderate, with moderate to severe pain had statistically significant pain relief compared to the placebo group. Now, a lot of people say, well, there've been a lot of other studies. They haven't really found that same result. Um, but I think it's related uh, oftentimes to the type of chondroitin used. Um, some of the chondroitin that's out there is in a very large molecule. Some of the ones that work better are smaller molecule that can be absorbed better. And how much does your body absorb? The other supplement that I'm really big on is turmeric or curcumin. So turmeric is a rhizomatous plant in the ginger family. And within turmeric, uh, you have curcumin, which is the main polyphenol. And it has natural anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. The FDA classifies this as safe. Um, the most common supplementation is 500 milligrams, one to three times per day. Sometimes you'll see this uh, added uh, with some black pepper, which can increase the bioavailability of the uh, curcumin or turmeric. 
The side effects are rare. Uh, in the higher doses, you could get some diarrhea, headache, even a rash, yellow stool. Uh, but again, this is quite rare. And what's amazing, and this is uh, based on a 2016 systematic review looking at eight uh, randomized controlled trials, which is the highest level of study that we have in medicine. And they found that eight to 12 weeks of supplements uh, with turmeric or curcumin could reduce arthritis symptoms and result in improvements similar to taking a non steroidal anti inflammatory like Motrin or Aleve or a prescription anti inflammatory. Uh, admittedly, the studies were limited by small sample size. But again, I can tell you in my practice that this works for a lot of patients and they don't have to take prescription medicine. The other uh, supplement that I, I do like to recommend is collagen. In, in fact, it has better ben greater benefits than glucosamine, even though glucosamine is uh, considered more popular. Uh, it's absorbed best in the hydrolyzed form, so if you do buy it, make sure to check for that. But it's felt to help induce cartilage regeneration by increasing the synthesis of cartilage matrix components it can also uh, help protect against joint damage through its influence on the induction of these T regulatory cells, as well as the production of these anti-inflammatory cytokines. And uh, in 2018, um, there was, again, a nice study, uh, a meta-analysis. So it's looking at all the studies out there that um, examine collagen and found that it's effective in improving joint mobility, decreasing joint stiffness, and decreasing pain. The other thing, which is kind of interesting, is cherries. Um, now, I can't say I'm recommending this uh, routinely to my patients, um, but it's some, certainly something to, uh, to consider. Uh, both sweet and tart cherries are rich sources of polyphenols, uh, the anthocyanins, melatonin, carotenoids, vitamin C, and vitamin E. And uh, the idea is that this helps decrease the systemic inflammation in your body. So this can help not only with osteoarthritis, but diabetes, cardiovascular disease, even sleep because of the melatonin, and cognitive function. There have been several studies showing uh, an overall anti-inflammatory effect uh, with cherries. This is one study uh, that I think is the best one that's been done. And again, a randomized, double-blind, crossover study. Um, but they did have patients drink quite a bit. I don't know if this is practical for everybody, but they had two eight-ounce bottles of cherry juice. Uh, for six weeks, and that did find significant decline in systemic inflammation levels in those who were consuming the cherry juice. They also found a decrease in pain, stiffness, and function in those uh, consuming the cherry. In terms of medications, I have to say I, I try and stay away from this as much as possible. Um, the safest one out there is probably acetaminophen. It is recommended by multiple organizations as the first uh, line treatment. Um, it's less effective than a non um, but it can provide some low-level short-term uh, analgesia. Um, there are, though, uh, some potential adverse effects with prolonged use that you do need to be careful of. Non-steroidals, um, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, again, like uh, Motrin, Aleve, or things like Celebrex uh, prescription medications. These can be effective, but you know, there's a lot of potential side effects to your kidneys, cardiovascular problems, certainly potential for ulcers. So what I've really been going to uh, more lately is uh, if I think patients need this, if they tried some other things, um, is a topical non -steroidal. So now you can uh, use a cream. And in fact, Voltaren cream is now something you can buy over the counter. 
Um, so because it's just topical, there's less chance of these systemic side effects. Other medications that you might hear about, I, I tend to stay away from these. Um, they have a little bit of benefit, but particularly for some of the tramadol or the opiates, uh, it's just not worth uh, the side of potential side effects unless the pain is really severe and somebody who's waiting for a knee replacement or for a health reason can't get one and we really need to give them some pain relief when everything else fails. Other things to consider uh, for natural ways to reduce pain and inflammation, fish oil, um, avocado, avocado uh, soy, um, sapophiable, have a hard time saying that, boswellia, uh, bioflavonoids and phytoflavonoids, something called devil's claw, bromelian, or even ginger. I now want to go into some injection options because, you know, I think the lifestyle medicine options and the supplements, uh, they can help a lot of patients. Uh, but for many of my patients, we do need to consider different uh, injections to help get things under control. And uh, I'm going to go through uh, these most common ones. And let's start with corticosteroids. Um, corticosteroid injections can work. Um, keep in mind, though, that it's only going to give you short-term improvement for up to about six weeks, maybe up to three months. Um, the National Institute of Health uh, completed a, a nice uh, randomized clinical trial over two years. And what they found, though, is that these repetitive corticosteroid injections, which is something I would never recommend, and they were doing this every three months for two years, but it led to increased cartilage loss. So for a number of reasons, um, you know, we might do one or two steroid injections, or if somebody only needs it once a year or so, I think it's reasonable. Um, but I do think there are better options. The one that I really do like, and one of the reasons being is that it is covered by most insurances, so patients don't have to pay out of their pocket, but these hyaluronic acid injections, uh, you've probably heard different terms for it, uh, it's under also called visco supplementation. Um, but hyaluronic acid naturally occurs within cartilage and in the joint synovial fluid. And it provides a, kind of like a buffer. It gives these viscoelastic properties to the synovial fluid. What happens with neosteoarthritis is the uh, hyaluronic acid within your knee drops from a high molecular weight that is very stable to a low molecular weight. And then it offers less protection for the knee. And the results of multiple studies uh, suggest that hyaluronic acid is a very effective intervention in treating knee osteoarthritis uh, without increased risk of adverse side effects. Um, therefore, the current evidence does suggest the use of this in treating knee osteoarthritis. Now, I have to say that, unfortunately, a couple years ago, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery uh, did come out with a paper that said that they didn't feel it was very helpful. And because of this, a lot of insurance companies have stopped paying for it. Since that time, a lot of other professional organizations have come out with their own papers to try and refute this because there were some questions on how they came up with that analysis uh, and their statistical interpretation. Um, but if insurance uh, pays for this, I think it's a really a great way to start if you're gonna um, go for injections. These are some studies, one of which I was part of, showing that these hyaluronic acid injections can actually delay or prevent uh, patients from having to go for knee replacement surgery. The next big thing that many of you have probably heard about are platelet-rich plasma injections. And what this is, is we actually take some of your own blood and we separate the blood uh, essentially into th three components. You've got red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And Platelets uh, help your blood clot. Um, 
but they're also filled with these natural uh, growth factors that help your body uh, heal. And so they can stimulate your body's own stem cells uh, to potentially uh, produce new cartilage, although that is debatable. But if nothing else, it, the literature clearly shows that this uh, PRP, particularly when it's concentrated, can decrease these pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. The studies definitely suggest that PRP injections improve functional outcomes, reduce symptoms, improve quality of life in patients with knee osteoarthritis. But like all of these things, um, the earlier we can catch patients um, before their cartilage is completely worn down, the better chance they're going to have for success. There are a few studies, uh, you know, looking at this, but we're still waiting for larger randomized controlled studies to really assess the full efficacy and duration of this treatment. But really where we're headed um, is really more what we call personalized PRP and being able to concentrate it and formulate it in a way that's best for your own body. So there's a lot of research going on, uh, and particularly at Stanford, uh, trying to understand this better. You might ask, well, how does PRP compare with hyaluronic acid? And a nice uh, systematic review just came out. It looked at 12 studies from uh, 17,300 patients comparing PRP to hyaluronic acid. And they did find that the PRP was superior to hyaluronic acid for reducing pain. But in terms of functional outcomes, in terms of what can you really do uh, act, in terms of your activity levels, there wasn't that big of a difference. So yes, PRP seems to be better, but it's not that much better, which also is another reason that justifies, I think, particularly since you have to pay for PRP, insurance doesn't cover the cost, that I, I recommend starting with the hyaluronic acid injections. Now, this study just came out looking at what if you combine the hyaluronic acid with the PRP? And it does seem that this works better and more synergistically than either treatment alone. Although I do have to say uh, one fault of this study was that uh, it clearly works better than the hyaluronic acid alone, but they didn't have a control, control group with just pure PRP. And the latest craze and things I'm sure a lot of you have heard about, and maybe why you're tuning into this lecture, is stem cell treatment. And the idea of stem cells is that you can take a cell, a, st a cell before it's proliferated, and you can help it induce to form new cartilage or new bone or new muscle or new tendon. Um, now, what I'd like to show you, this is an article uh, that was just highlighted this morning in uh, the Stanford uh, Medicine Report. And uh, this study uh, was just produced uh, in Nature Medicine from our Stanford Stem Cell Institute. And it's really exciting because <clears throat> they found that um, you can in fact regenerate cartilage with these activated stem cells. Um, they used a localized delivery system <clears throat> of using bone morphogenetic protein 2 with a vascular endothelial growth factor receptor antagonist to help ag activate these skeletal stem cells. But keep in mind, this study was just focusing on uh, an injury to the articular cartilage that was very localized not the more general type of cartilage uh, damage that we see with osteoarthritis. But still, the results are incredibly promising. And I think in the years to come, you're, you're only going to hear more and more about this. Um, I would like to share with you, though, what we do know at this point. Um, and because there are people out there who are offering this, we do offer this for our patients, but I just want patients to be realistic about what to expect. Um, I'm personally not doing this in my clinic, but one of my colleagues is. Um, and the idea, again, is to stimulate these 
pluripotential cells to go on to regenerate the cartilage. Now you can get these stem cells from your bone marrow or the, or your actually your own fat. Um, the true nature of these techniques though are, it's not true stem cells that what they're really, uh, the, the proper term now is called signaling cells. So you're sort of turning on the stem cell um, as opposed to this being a true stem cell. And there are still not a lot of great studies on this, but you know, every year I go to a huge conference that talks about this and it's, you know, there's just our newer studies coming out all the time. Now I can tell you about a few studies that we do have. Uh, this study compared the amount of growth factors, the amount of um, uh, inflammatory cytokines and chemokines uh, between bone marrow concentrate and platelet-rich plasma. And they did find that the bone marrow uh, concentrate did have significantly higher interleukin-1 uh, RA concentration, which is a significant uh, anti-inflammatory component uh, than the PRP. So you'd say, well, that must work better than PRP. But it's not so clear. This is a study that compared bone marrow aspirate directly with PRP and found that there wasn't a great difference between these. Now, the author of this, uh, Dr. Shapiro, uh, I recently heard him present his results and he does admit that his technique for the bone marrow aspirate may not have been optimal. So, you know, maybe this wasn't a fair comparison, but it, it really is the best randomized control study we have so far. Now with this technique, they're getting the bone marrow uh, out from your iliac crest. So it does require some anesthesia. It can typically be done with local anesthetic, but it can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, and you need to take multiple aspirations. The fat, and this is a benefit that some patients like, can actually be taken uh, from your abdomen, or it can be taken from the uh, fat pad, the infrapatellar fat pad um, below your kneecap. It does appear that the, you can get a higher yield of these mesenchymal cell, stem cells or signaling cells from the fat versus the bone marrow. So theoretically, the fat should be better, uh, but again, it's not that clear. Uh, this is a study uh, that compared microfragmented adipose tissue, which is considered one of the best ways to concentrate the fat versus the bone marrow aspirate. Uh, and the bottom line is that both groups improved and there wasn't really a significant difference between them. So the good news is that both of these work. Um, it's not clear as one really superior. Uh, that might become more clear with future studies. And then finally, uh, a newer product that's now on the market is with uh, freeze-dried amniotic tissue derivatives. And this would be from not your own amniotic tissue, obviously, but from uh, somebody else. Um, and the beauty of this amniotic tissue is that it still hasn't differentiated. So it, it is filled with these anti-inflammatory and regenerative cytokines and growth factors that potentially can help, like these other treatments, decrease the inflammation associated with osteoarthritis. Be a little bit careful though, because a lot of people are marketing this as a stem cell treatment and telling you that it's gonna regrow cartilage and we really don't have any studies to support that. With that said, it still might be a nice thing to offer patients um, that is just another part of our uh, uh, tool in the toolbox that, that can help keep patients going. <clears throat> so in summary, um, there are no pharmacologic agents, agents for knee osteoarthritis that can halt disease progression. Um, 
it is important to offer a range of therapies to enable patients to take control over the treatment process, to give them a sense of empowerment. And this is where combining lifestyle medicine approaches can really have an additive effect on EOA treatment. The biologic treatments that I talked about um, definitely may slow down the progression of osteoarthritis and potentially uh, help regenerate articular cartilage, although we definitely need for further research and studies to substantiate this. So I'd like to thank you, and, and hopefully we still have plenty of time for questions. Hi, Dr. Fredrickson. Yes, we've got lots of questions coming in, and um, many on, um, on the supplements and the questions about that. And the first is, is there a brand and form of glucosamine and collagen that you recommend in particular? And then the second to that question is also, should people try all these concurrently all at the same time, or should they be introduced one at a time in terms of supplements? Yeah, no, thanks for that question, because that comes up a lot. Um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mention a particular brand, Nora. Is that okay? Yeah, no, that's fine. I mean, th this, is, this isn't necessarily a sales pitch. It's just a question that, uh, you know, you, you give an honest answer to, so that's great. Um, yeah, so the one that I tend to recommend is called Cosamine DS, double strength. And you can get this at any local drugstore. It is a little bit more expensive, but what I like about it is that they actually have a patent on that chondroitin molecule. So it's smaller than most of those that on the market, and it's therefore potentially better absorbed and has better bioavailability. And, and most of the studies that have been successful um, have used that brand, okay. at least a number of the studies. Um, in terms of whether to start everything at once, I think it, a lot of it depends on your overall health, on what kind of pain you're dealing with. I mean, it, ideally, you'd want to try one, see how that works for a month or two, then try something else. Um, I don't see anything wrong, though, with starting the glucosamine with something like uh, a good curcumin supplement or even with the collagen, just because they have different mechanisms of action. Um, but if you want to be more systematic about it, I'd say start one, give it a couple months, and then move on to one of the other supplements. Great, thank you. Um, this question's interesting too. Does glucosamine and chondroitin repair cartilage so that we can stop taking them, or do they, we need to take them forever? Well, it's not clear uh, if it definitely repairs cartilage. Um, you know, we're sort of giving your body the building blocks to repair cartilage. Um, but you have to say, you know, this is used a lot in, uh, by veterinarians for dogs and horses who have osteoarthritis, and it works in that population. So there's definitely something to it. Now, what I've always wondered, is it just helping with the inflammation or is it actually helping with the cartilage? Um, and, I don't think it helps rebuild brand new cartilage, like it's not gonna give you a brand new knee, but if nothing else, um, it can help prevent the cartilage from breaking down further. That's great. Um, are there any medications or conditions that are not compatible with these supplements that people need to be aware of before they start taking them? Well, you know, people used to say, um, if you were diabetic, be careful with glucosamine because that, that glucosamine breaks down to glucose um, and an, uh, an amino acid. Um, and they thought, well, if you take too much, it could raise your blood sugar, but you'd have to take a lot more than what's prescribed for that to happen. At the prescribed doses I, I outlined, um, that shouldn't be an issue, even if you're a diabetic. Um, the other ones in terms of collagen, the curcumin, uh, certainly the cherries. Um, I'm not aware of it interfering with other health conditions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Dr. Fredrickson, is there any study or evidence that the techniques that you've proposed and the glucosamine, chondroitin, or turmeric and curcumin um, and other medications can have a positive impact also on hip joint pain? 
is this a, a, a protocol that would work across the board in terms of joint degeneration? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, almost everything I talked about is going to work with every form of arthritis and definitely for hips. Um, I, you know, the, the studies that have looked at, for instance, exercise, um, you know, it works, seems to work a little better for the knee than the hip, um, but still it works well for the hip. Um, but all of these supplements are going to work just as well for the hip as, as well as the knee. Um, or if you have arthritis elsewhere in your thumb or even in, um, you know, your ankle, um, it should still be, a, you know, potentially beneficial. The nice thing about these, you know, it's not going to work for everybody. I don't want people to think this is some kind of cure-all. Um, but they are things that if you put it all together and really adjust your lifestyle and change your diet, um, all together, these things can make an impact. And if nothing else, it just improves your overall health. Thanks. That's great. Um, here's a question about... Um, whether if you're using turmeric as a the spice instead of buying a 500 milligram supplement, what would be the equivalent in, in a measuring a teaspoon or, or form of measurement that would, that would be comparable to a 500 milligram supplement? You know, I'm not sure the answer to that question. And there's, a, you know, a lot of people uh, talk about what kind of turmeric and does it come from the root of the tumor? Uh, turmeric is a turmeric root, which is where more of the curcumin comes from. Um, so part of it is the type of brand of it, um, but I'm not sure of the equivalency in terms of dosing. Um, is there a certain brand of turmeric because of recent concerns regarding lead? Uh, do you have any suggestions on that? Yeah, you definitely want to go with a company that you know, has a good track record and, and really is very careful about how they produce this. Um, there is a brand through, uh, it's called Designs for Health, and they, it's called Curcumin Avail, and they combine a couple different varieties of the curcumin together um, that, you know, my patients have found very effective. Perfect, thank you. This question is about glucosamine. It's sometimes paired with MSM. What are your thoughts on this combination and what is the dosage to take with glucosamine concentrate? So, uh, well, just for the, so the glucosamine you want, the recommended dose is about 1500 milligrams a day. Um, and that's typically, depending on the brand you buy, gonna be about three tablets a day. Um, and the chondroitin about 1200 milligrams a day. I'm not sure about the dosing for the MSM. Um, I didn't, the, the brand I, I'm recommending, the Cosamine, doesn't have that. I know that it does work for some patients, but I do have some patients who the MSM has sulfur in it, and some patients actually have a bad reaction to the sulfur. So you just, I would, nothing wrong with trying it, but I would just be careful and just make sure your body isn't one that is sensitive to the sulfur. Is there a correlation between treatment or program and the grade or the stage of your osteoarthritis in terms of its improvement? Well, you know, as I said before, the earlier we can start these things, the better off you're going to be. Um, most patients that I see are going to come in typically when they're around that grade two, three. So they're getting these bone spurs, they're starting to get some of joint space narrowing, but they're not yet bone on bone. Um, once you're bone on bone, that can be get, come really painful and, and that's tough to treat. So, you know, the earlier you can come in the better. Now I'm not suggesting that people go to their doctor and ask for an x-ray if they're asymptomatic, because if you're asymptomatic, we're probably not gonna do much, right? Even if the x-ray shows something. Uh, and that's why that x-ray I showed earlier and I said, why are there some patients that come see me and they've got really bad x-rays, but they're still doing great. Um, and I think it's because they've got a good lifestyle. They're controlling that systemic inflammation with their diet and some of these other things they might be doing um, that allows their body to deal with this. 
And some patients come in and they've got minimal findings on their x-ray and they're in ex incredible pain. And I think it's just because the inflammation in their body is sort of out of control. Are there any websites you recommend um, on knee exercises that can help with pain or knee exercises not to do to prevent increasing pain? Um, you know, I don't have a great resource on that. Um, I have some handouts and clinics that I give patients, but, um, you know, I'm sure there are some good websites. I just don't have one off the top of my mind that I can recommend at this, at this moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, this, this person asks, I often have right knee pain going upstairs. Should I push through the pain and go up the steps normally to maintain function, or should I lead with my left foot to avoid the pain? Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's a tough one. I, I know my, my father-in-law has the same issue. And, uh, so, and I, 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 you know, I think the main thing, my main message is really figure out why you're having the pain, um, and, and see if there's something you can do to address it because pushing through the pain is probably not a great idea. Um, certainly if it gets worse, the more you push through it. Uh, and then just favoring the other leg is going to lead to some bad habits and that aren't good either. So as much as you can, I would try and figure out what's going on. And if need be, you know, see, see a physician uh, who can help you figure that out. Is there a specific collagen supplement that you recommend? Um, I don't have a particular one, although I will say uh, this, this company designs for health, um, does make products that I trust and they've got a, a really nice uh, whole body collagen. Uh, they also have something called Arthrobin, which is collagen yeah. also with um, some natural um, COX-2 inhibitors, which help with inflammation. Um, so either the Arthrobin or the whole body collagen can be, can be effective. This is a question about THC and CBD and person says they found that the topical application of a cannabis infused balm um, helps reduce knee pain rather quickly. So exercise can continue biking, Stairmaster or walking. I was wondering what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the literature clearly shows that, that CBD uh, can, you know, there, we actually have receptors in our brain for this. And, and, and a lot of this, it can definitely help control inflammation. Um, so it's, it's a nice alternative. Um, you know, people get nervous about the THC and whether that might have some other benefits that you don't want. Um, but, you know, I would say the key is one, go for a brand that, you know, is, is very purified, right? Because you don't want a lot of other unnecessary things in there that potentially are toxic to your system. And go for a higher strength. Um, to really get good pain relief, you're going to want something that's concentrated with at least 400 milligrams of CBD. They now have brands up to 1,000 milligrams. I'm not sure if that works necessarily better than the 400, but you, you do want something at least the strength of 400 milligrams of CBD. And does the THC contribute as well? Because there is some literature to suggest that, that some THC can also help with the inflammation, but... Um, it's not, it's not absolutely necessary to have that. Okay. Terrific. Um, another question, how can we find out more about gait alteration and then how can we find the correct shoes for that or corrective shoes? Well, you really need to have somebody, uh, look at your alignment. Um, some of this we can tell, you know, from an x-ray, but really looking at you in a clinic setting, watching you walk. Um, that's really the only way to do it. Um, sometimes we need to put patients on a treadmill and really uh, measure things a little more carefully with different markers and things. But usually just looking at their alignment, how they walk, um, will give us a lot of information. Okay, great. Now I've got several questions um, about PRP injection site. Is important to be effective? Do you agree is the question? 
Also, if insurance doesn't cover it, do you know about how much it costs? And if a doctor says PRP doesn't work, should I find a new doctor? <laughs> um, we stack those for you. Yeah, what was the first part of that again? First part of it is um, PRP injection site is important to be infective. Is that correct? Not fully understanding that one. That wherever the, the injection site for the treatment is important. For, well, I mean, for, for if, you're using, if you're using it for knee osteoarthritis, I mean, the key thing is to make sure you inject it into the joint. Okay. Um, so, and, and, you know, there's, depending on your body habitus, um, that might be easy to do in the clinic, but for some patients, um, I'll use a, an ultrasound machine to make sure I'm getting into the right spot, um, particularly for patients um, who are a bit overweight. Um, but, you know, most, most, you know, people in my field are, are quite skilled at getting in the right spot. In terms of um, the cost, um, at Stanford, it's roughly $1,500. Um, and that's something set by the hospital. I had nothing to do with that. Um, it's not nearly what the physicians get for that, believe me. Um, but, you know, it, I'd wish it, I wish it was more affordable for patients, but that's just where the price point is right now. Uh, if your doctor tells you it doesn't work, you know, the, the thing is, is that we, we still need better controlled studies, right, to be able to say definitively. And so, you know, your doctor might be, you know, reading a review paper that is looking at, you know, the hardest core evidence and looking for what's called level one research. And there isn't a lot of that out there for PRP, unfortunately. Right, and is it typically effective for about three months? Yeah, yeah, about three months, sometimes uh, up to six. Uh, I have some patients it works for up to a year. Um, it's one of those things, it doesn't work for everybody, but if it works for you, you love it. Um, and I have some patients, you know, who come in twice a year, some patients once a year. Um, and this is a question on, on um, recommending books uh, on food, on the diet um, that you've discussed. Are there any that you particularly recommend? I don't have a, you know, a, a go-to book. Just, you know, there's so much controversy about, about diets out there. Right. Um, as I mentioned, um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is a really big proponent of a plant-based diet if you really want to control inflammation. Um, I find the anti-inflammatory diet, uh, the Mediterranean diet is um, one that is more accessible for patients. And if you just uh, Google that, um, you'll see a lot of information. There's a Dr. Andrew Weil and he's got a lot of information on his website about that diet. And you can even sign up for sort of a, he'll take you through a couple week introduction and how to, how to really get into that and give you recipes and such. Great. Um, I think we have this one last question um, and then we'll be out of time for this evening. What is the brand of shoe that you mentioned? And where is it available? Um, you, so, uh, you used to be able to find it at, at some of the specialized uh, shoe stores, but you can definitely find it online. And uh, so it's called the ABEO, A-B-E-O Smart System. And so if, so if you just make sure it's the A-B-E-O brand and then within that, the Smart System shoe. And then you'll see, and it'll talk about how they, you know, partnered with the Stanford doctor and, and such. But you Thank can, you. if nothing else, you can order it online. Um, Thank you, Dr. Fredrickson. Yeah. This has been a really wonderful and informational evening. And I'd like to thank you very much for giving us your time and all this information. And for everyone watching this, um, this video will be available on demand. And if you have questions about some of the articles mentioned in it, the Health Library can help you find those. We can uh, do research 
and pursue some of your further questions. If you just write to us, our research uh, program is free and we have medical librarians who make uh, use of information and, and uh, journals that are not available for free to the public. So we're available for that. And so um, on that note, I'm gonna say good night and thank you, Dr. Fredrickson for another wonderful lecture. Oh, good thank night, you, everyone. thank you.